And again, if you are not talking, please mute. Okay, we're live. All right. <coughs> Faisal, can you mute, mute please? Okay. And Jim, Yamzu, can you mute? Great. Okay, great. Absolutely. All right, good evening and welcome to the July 22nd meeting of the uh, Park Authority Board. Uh, I'm Bill Bowie. Um, to conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance, Park Authority Board needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record, as we did with our last couple of meetings. During our meeting, if you wish to be recognized, please raise your hand. And when I recognize you, please state your name. This will ensure that you are recognized and the public knows who is speaking. If you intend to vote nay or abstain on any item, we will need to do a roll call on those votes. Because of each member of this board is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and, and appropriate volume for all of the other members. Accordingly, I'm gonna conduct a roll call and ask each board member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure we can hear each one of your colleagues and following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member's voice. We will start by going alphabetically. Dr. Adu. Abna Adu from my residence in Lee District. Dr. Carter. Cynthia Jacobs Carter from my residence in Lee District. Maggie Godbold. Maggie Godbold from my residence in the Sully District. Linwood Gorham. Linwood Gorham from my residence in the Mount Vernon district. Tim Hackman. Tim Hackman from my residence in the Drainsville district. Ron Kendall. Ron Kendall from my home in Mason district. Faisal Khan. Faisal Khan from my residence in Providence district. Ken Quincy. Ken Quincy, I'm at my residence in the Providence district. Hal Stone. Kyle Stone from Emerald Isle, North Carolina. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Mike Thompson. Mike Thompson from Springfield District. And Jim Zook. Jim Zook from a residence in Springfield District. Okay. And I'm Bill Bowie, and I am attending from my <laughs> residence in the Hunter Mill District. At this point, I'm going to pass the virtual gavel over to Vice Chairman Quincy so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of this board. Ken Quincy, you have heard the motion. Is there a second? Mike Thompson, I second this motion. It has been moved, and Ken Quincy, it has been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify me. Aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion passes. Thank you. This is Bill Bowie. Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures. The fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic communication is being used, and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by COVID the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this board to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And that as such FOIA's usual procedures, which require the physical assembly of the board and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this board may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated video conference It'd be so moved. Ken Quincy, you have heard the motion. Is there a second? Tim Hackman, I second the motion. Ken Quincy, is there discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Mr. Chairman, the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Quincy. Bill Bowie. 
Finally, it is next required that all matters addressed on today's agenda must address the state of emergency itself or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of this board's lawful purpose, duties, and responsibilities. It is so moved. Ken Quincy, you have heard the motion. Is there a second? Mike Thompson, I second this motion. Ken Quincy, is there a discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Mr. Cho Chairman, the motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Quincy. Uh, now that the pregame is over, it's time for the real show to begin. Administrative item number one, and I was hoping I would never, ever get to this, <laughs> but unfortunately, I'm going to have to. Administrative item number one is the resolution honoring Dave Bowden upon his retirement from the Fairfax County Park Authority. Is there a second? Second. Second. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was kind of worried there. All, oh, those in favor, all of those in favor say aye. Is there any discussion? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Motion carries. So the aye. resolution, the resolution reads, and I really, while the public, if anybody from the public is out there, um, this resolution does not do justice to what uh this guy has meant to all of us uh and the park authority so i'll uh, i'll have a precursor by by saying that there is no way that we could ever list this even in a book as war as long as war and peace for the contributions that uh, that dave has made so without further ado whereas planning and development division director dave bowden is retiring after 23 years of service to the Fairfax County Park Authority, having provided $350 million in parks and recreation facilities to the residents of Fairfax County over multiple years through voter-approved bond funds. And whereas Dave oversaw the activities of a division of 40 professional engineers and planners and directed staff in land acquisition planning, design, contracting, project management, and new ventures for the development of park and recreation facilities, and was also responsible for directing and coordinating the agency's long-term, long-range plans and strategies for implementing the plans, including the Capital Improvement Fund program. And whereas they've developed nationally recognized park facilities, with partners such as the Joey Pisano Memorial Fund for development of the fully inclusive Chessie's Big Backyard Family Recreation Area, the Annalena Society for Development of Observatory Park, local youth sports organizations in development of synthetic turf fields to increase playing time for youth, and the Washington Nationals baseball team and the Major League Baseball in the development of the Bryce Harper Baseball Field Complex to provide local youth with an exceptional facility and help the Washington Nationals and Major League Baseball celebrate the 2018 All-Star Game in Washington, D.C. And whereas Dave worked with the Park Authority Board for buy-in with agency strategic <laughs> initiatives, including the Capital Improvement Plan and routinely reported progress on the plans to the Park Authority Board, as well as preparing the division's yearly operating budget and capital construction budget and monitored expenditures for efficient use of the funds. And whereas Dave was a strong representative for the Park Authority in matters of park planning and development, other board and commission meetings and represented the agency in meetings with public and private sector officials and citizens groups. And whereas Dave has been praised by Park Board Chairman William Bowie as a person who could always find that path to yes, and by the Park Authority Deputy Director Sarah Baldwin as someone whose tireless efforts provide a gold medal park system through the community will be felt for generations to come. And now therefore being resolved 
by the Fairfax County Park Authority Board that expresses appreciation and thanks to Dave Bowden for dedicated and outstanding contributions to the Park Authority and the residents of Fairfax County adopted by the Fairfax County Park Authority Board on July 22nd, 2020. Dave, what can we say? The floor is yours. Oh, uh, thank you, Chairman Bowie. Dave Bowden. Turn on your camera. Uh, is it not working? There it is. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman Bowie. Dave Bowden, Director of Planning and Development, for three more weeks. <laughs> First off, I need to thank my lovely wife and best friend, Cynthia, for putting up with all those evenings and weekends that I was out of the house for community meetings and celebrations, as well as all those unplanned side trips to look at parks under construction during weekend grocery shopping trips. If the great Hall of Fame baseball player Lou Gehrig was the luckiest man on the face of the earth, then surely I am the second luckiest man. If anyone would have told me almost 40 years ago when I walked through the front doors of the Park Authority headquarters, that small house office in Annandale Community Park at the time, that I would spend my entire professional career planning, designing, and building parks and recreation facilities to improve the quality of life of Fairfax County community, and in addition, get to travel the world providing morale, recreation, and welfare facilities for the deserving servicemen and women of our armed forces. Well, to quote a former director of the county's Department of Planning and Zoning, when he arrived late to a county team discussion on reopening the county's closed I-95 landfill and funding development of the Laurel Hill Sportsplex, I would have probably responded the exact same way he did. I don't know what you all are smoking, but it must be pretty good stuff. It gets to a point in a long career when what you do is no longer as important as the people you do it with and the people you are doing it for. Bill mentioned in his remarks that he's proud to call me his friend. From my side of the equation, that's woefully short of adequately expressing my feelings. The word that comes to mind when I think of Bill is inspiration. So to Bill and all the board members, fellow Park Authority management team and staff, especially current and former members of the planning and development community uh, team, our friends groups, park volunteers, youth leadership, and other community organizations have put in countless hours making Fairfax a better place to live Thank you for allowing me this wonderful journey and inspiring me to always find ways to meet the needs of our community. As Director of Planning and Development, I've had plenty of opportunities to reflect over the past years on the creation and evolution of the park system <clears throat> we have all worked so hard to sustain. It never ceases to, to amaze me the forethought the original founders of the Park Authority and early park staff put into the development of our park system that has stood the test of time over 70 years, as evidenced by our four national gold medals as the best in the nation. I leave you with the following thought. As my senior class in high school debated the selection of a class song, we had narrowed the final choice down to two popular songs of the day, one by the band Queen and one by Fleetwood Mac. So if you haven't guessed my age before, certainly I just gave it away. The song we were considering by Queen was We Are the Champions, and much like the Park Authority and our gold medals, my classmates and I had many athletic and academic achievements throughout our four years of high school to reflect on with the selection of this song. However, we end up choosing the Fleetwood Mac song, Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Seems like the lyrics, don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Don't stop, it'll soon be here. It'll be better than before. Yesterday's gone, yesterday's gone. Are just as appropriate mantra for today's uncertain times as they were for the uncertain futures of me and my fellow high school seniors. So I'll leave with you with thank you again. It's been my honor and my privilege to work with you and be inspired by you as we continue the Park Authority's gold medal legacy. That was really good. We're not going to go on quite yet to admin item number two. We're going to go around the horn. So I know lots of people have lots of things to say. To say. So I'll start with you, uh, Vice Chairman Quincy. Well, what can I say? I've worked with uh, with Dave 
through the Planning and Development Committee, and I think others have said this, he, he works to get it done, and most times it's under budget. And I've just really enjoyed working with him. He's, he's, uh, he's a person that, <clears throat> that never, sees, never sees defeat when he goes after a project. He always sees the positive, and 99% of the time, he gets it. And I, I, I've just been uh, both pleased and educated by working with, uh, with Dave. And uh, I'm sorry to see him go. I guess he's not going too far, though. So that's good. But uh, I'm sure with his expertise and working with the management team that... Uh, whoever comes in to fill the shoes will be most qualified. And I thank you, Dave, for all you've done. Thanks, Ken. Mike? <clears throat> um, we've talked a lot about Dave as, as what he's done for the Park Authority, and, and it's incredible what he's accomplished. But I would also be remiss if, if I didn't point out that he is a man of great integrity, a man who stood in front of meetings large and small who you could count on to not only tell the truth and not only you know be honest with you but also to work to create to come up with creative solutions and then follow through to get those done so dave you are somebody who i hope uh we all try to emulate and and recognize that you are a man who has gotten great things done but also are a man of of great moral character and thank you for for everything appreciate it jim oh skip to the end here let me get back on you're there now you're off you turn you were on all right you thank off. you that's counterintuitive to me well, i <laughs> had the pleasure of uh, working with dave uh when i was on the staff with with Fairfax County and the Department of Planning and Zoning. And I think the relationships between those departments uh, has been excellent over the years. And a lot of that has to do with uh, leadership. Um, also, I've had the opportunity to uh, see him perform in a different environment, that being on the Park Authority Board. And uh, Dave, I really want you to know, I appreciate uh, the professionalism that you have always displayed and uh, the tremendous amount of work that you and your staff have done to further the park system in uh, Fairfax County. So I wish you the very best in the future and um, begin to have some fun at your parks. Yeah. Linwood. Dave, all I can say is I've just thoroughly enjoyed working with you. I've always found you to be very likable guy. I think everybody that you come in contact with, including our constituents, think that absolute competent in every way. It's just been an honor and a pleasure. I wish you the best. And I hope this is congratulations on your retirement, but I hope it's not goodbye. Thank you. Tim? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tim Ackman. Um, Dave, you have been the uh, the touchstone of, of integrity and transparency and uh, uh, unbelievably efficient and, and professional at what you do and um, as I, as I've mentioned before we will we will all miss you greatly uh, and I can imagine your successor um, coming in and to fill your shoes and saying please give me a, a, a double measure of, of, of what Dave had great. That's precious great. Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Maggie Godbold. Dave, um, you were one of the first uh, uh, folks at the Park Authority that I uh, met when I became the, the uh, board member. And, and you, to me, exemplify what almost everybody I know at the Park Authority is, and that is you get it done. And you get it done on time, sometimes below cost, and always with a smile on your face. Your service ethic and your ability to work with everybody in the community is, is just so inspiring. And I, 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 I wish you a wonderful retirement. I hope you enjoy, um, and I hope you don't go too far. We will miss you. We will all miss you very much. Thank you, Dave. 
Thank you. Faisal? Well, I have a pleasure of knowing Dave and working with a couple of projects since last eight years I'm on the board. And I like everybody said that I have found him amazing in every which way you can say. And on top of all, I mean, it, we, it's, it's not overlooked at all, but it's worth mentioning that the quality of his work at the end, the end result is just amazing. And if you look at that, that tells you everything that's all the work that's been put behind that. Well, we said that we're definitely going to miss him. And like Tim said, it's, it's the, the big shoes to fill, whoever comes. But we hope he doesn't go too far. And good luck with your retirement, Dave. And please stay in touch. We can still use you. Right. Uh, I'm without words on Dave. I can't imagine him not being there. I can't imagine him not being able to answer all those questions that I know are in front of me. Uh, I'm sure whoever replaces him and his staff will do a wonderful bang up job. But the thing I'm going to have to ask every one of them as they go through their processes, what will they do? Because that's the gold standard. Thanks, Dave. And somewhere along the line up front here, there's a party and it's going to happen. Here, here. Cynthia? Yes. Well, Dave, I was, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I had no idea that you were about to retire. So congratulations on that. It's been great working with you uh, all of this, uh, few, these few years. Um, and so when I think of you, I have one word to describe uh, you. Uh, I have others, but this one stands out. Exemplar. Exemplar. You are the real deal. So uh, I'm hoping that you will um, be a around to volunteer so that, um, you know, that so that as others have said, this is not goodbye. Uh, I always think back on our hearings when I looked around and things were getting a little um, boisterous you would be right there in the room and I would feel so brave. Oh, Dave is here. I would feel so brave. So thank you for that. And uh, also always enjoyed talking with you about your days at the Smithsonian and my days at the Smithsonian. So wishing you all the best. And remember, you are the real deal. Thank you. Kyle. Uh, this is really totally unacceptable. And the fact that you're leaving reflects really poorly on Kirk that he couldn't keep you around a little bit longer. Uh, but no, seriously, congratulations. Uh, very well deserved. I got to know Dave when I was in Supervisor Cook's office, so going on a decade now. And as Bill said, finding a pathway to yes is really important in kind of in our roles on the Park Authority, but it's absolutely invaluable when you're in a supervisor's office and there's someone in the government there that's trying to find a way to make the community happy. Um, it was great working with you then. It's even more fun working with you now. And it's, it's a huge hole to fill. Sad to see you go. But uh, again, congratulations. Have it up. So congratulations, Dave. Uh, I really appreciated how welcoming you were when I joined the board and you were more than willing to show me the ropes. I haven't figured them all out, but I'm still doing that. Um, I was very impressed with how hard you work and how um, good you are at your job. And the one thing that did stand out for me was the passion you had for your job. Um, I remember being with you at a ribbon cutting. I think it was for, and now I'm, I'm blanking, but in Lee District and just the excitement you had on your face about a finished project was very um, gratifying for me. So thank you so much for all you have done. And I wish you the very best. And as everyone else has said, please don't go too far. Congratulations. Great. Kirk, you have anything to say? Anything adding? I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kirk and Cannon, Director of the Park Authority. Dave, uh, back last fall, for some reason, I had the premonition 
and the forbearance to give you uh, my retirement gift for you uh, following our fourth gold medal recognition. And it was an autographed Phillies baseball, uh, from, I believe from 1983, the team. Uh, you were gracious. You accepted it. You said, what's this for? And I said, I'm giving you your retirement gift ahead of time. I don't know why, but I'm urged to. Given our current situation of the pandemic, I'm sure as heck glad I did that. Um, I am thankful for you, Dave, every step of the way that I've been back here. Um, I am thankful that you have the skills and the talents that you have. I'm thankful for your passion, your dedication, your professionalism, your demeanor, your spirit, and most of all, for your leadership and your friendship. You are by far the best I have ever worked with during my 40 year career. Thank you, Dave. And we will see you when you return and work for us. That's great. Sarah. You know, I, you know, I think I said it all in uh, the remarks on Dave's resolution. Dave has had a hand in hundreds of projects throughout the park system. Um, to think back from his career of when he started with the Park Authority, you know, years ago, and then came back. I mean, he's been involved with the development of rec centers, parks, athletic fields, name it. Dave really has had a hand in, in everything within our system. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we talk about a park, Dave can tell you where the electrical box is at, at that park, what year the chiller went in in a rec center. Um, so... You know, we are going to miss that institutional knowledge, but I know where Dave is moving in his uh, retirement, um, and I'm very envious, and hopefully I'll get to visit him in Hilton Head um, when, when I'm down visiting my mom. So I wish you the best, Dave. You're a wonderful guy to work with. Um, we'll, we'll sorely miss you. Amy? So I've been, I've had the pleasure of working with Dave um, overseeing the planning and development division. But with Dave at the helm, I had no worry, no problems, nothing that I had a concern over for all these years. No one told me when I walked in that he was going to be retiring. <laughs> so, uh, but um, he's been incredible to work with, an awesome colleague, incredible professional. Um, and I tried to chain him to the desk. But um, he's he's a um, a master, so uh, he's not going to be able to stay with us much longer. I just am thankful to have the time that I've had in knowing him and hope to see him in the future. Dave, I did find, and not many people know this, maybe about your sock love, your love of socks, and so. We had some socks made for you with the Park Authority shield on them so that you will remember us forever. So That's great. Greatly. We can't replace you. We're going to try, but we can't. Well, we, 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 really, we really can't replace it. I mean, I, I, I can't even think of, um, and we were in on some of the interviews, I can't even think of, uh, putting in a job description what Dave does because I mean it would take it would take the rest of the year to write that document and like you said all of the institutional knowledge and and the professional qualities Dave got us out of a countless numbers of jams with very creative thought very creative ideas and uh I'll make sure that uh, that we keep in constant communication, um, my friend, because uh, baseball is about to start. Uh, you'll get a little respite here, and we got we still got a lot of things going on. So, for the time being, you'll leave, but we'll we'll see you again really really soon. And uh, and when the time comes, we'll do something really really special. So, appreciate you. All right, we're going to go on to uh, admin item number two, which is the resolution honoring Chris Monson upon his retirement from the Fairfax County Park Authority. Is second. there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 
Bye. Bye. Okay. The resolution. Whereas Frying Pan Farm Park Assistant Equestrian Manager Chris Monson is retiring after more than 38 years of dedicated service to the Fairfax County Park Authority and the residents of Fairfax County, having worked in a wide variety of roles as a host of the Park Authority facilities, and whereas Chris Monson got his start as a seasonal employee at Eula Park in the early 1980s, interred at Burke Lake Park, interned at Burke Lake Park, not interred, <laughs> uh, Providence Rec Center and Nottaway Park during college, was hired after graduation as a full-time laborer three at Nottaway. Headed maintenance at Oakmar Rec Center when it opened in 1988, was promoted to assistant park specialist at Mason District Park, and spent some time at the historic rental properties before heading to frying pan to work in the equestrian area. And whereas Chris helped to oversee the additions of the new barns to the park in 2010, being heavily involved in a major role in the annual pre-Turkey Quarter Horse, horse Show from 1997 through 2019, running the event for more than half of those years. And whereas at Frying Pan Farm Park, he turned what some might have seen as a disadvantage into a plus, since he wasn't a rider and he had no preference for Western or English saddles, he was able to make strong connections with riders in both disciplines, helping help to organize the park many, park's many horse shows and substantially grow the program during his tenure. And whereas Chris Monson brought a wealth of experience to the job at Frying Pan Farm Park and was very important in helping with the big special events, overseeing parking each year for the well-attended 4-H Fair, and putting his great maintenance skills, time, and energy to use wherever he was needed. And whereas Chris was honored during his career with an outstanding performance award, and shared in a Trailblazer Award when Frying Pan Farm Park was named Site of the Year. And now therefore be it resolved by the Fairfax County Park Authority Board that it expresses appreciation and thanks to Chris Monson for dedicated and outstanding contributions to the Park Authority and the residents of Fairfax County adopted by the Fairfax County Park Authority Board on July 22nd, 2020. Congratulations, Chris. Absolutely amazing. Um, what what we've done at uh, what's been done at Frying Pan Farm Park is is just second to none. And uh, the combination of Chris and Dave uh, just present the kind of quality folks that we have uh, and that we really 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 needed to have the 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 uh, the very you know, uncommon park system that we have because we do a little bit of everything. We are unlike any other park system in the in the country, and uh, and that's something to be very proud of. So, couldn't have done it without you, Chris. Couldn't have done it without you, Dave. Uh, and you guys certainly leave a, a legacy um, going forward. And we know that you won't be strangers either. All right, on to action items. Action item number one, 20 carryover budget review from 10,001 general fund. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mike Baird here. Uh, as you mentioned, the first is action item one for the general fund, then I'll ask Hannah if she can. We have a kind of a presentation for that. It's really more just uh, in a statement than you know the actual board item but we'll kind of go over that uh the general fund as you well know 
uh, you know, like the District Revenue Fund, it was a fairly difficult year. Uh, but what you'll see here in the statement up in front of you, and I'll actually just circling back real quick, I'll mention with all four of the board items, uh, these are coming to you as action items. And these were submitted back in early July, July 2nd to the Department of Management and Budget to meet those deadlines. And now is the opportunity to bring these to you. Uh, so in regards to circling back to the general fund, you'll see there that we are actually returning about $2.6 million to the county. Uh, no surprise there in some ways, the personnel services, we are returning about 1.4 million. Operating budget, we came in under budget about $1.8 million. And also at the same time, the revenue budget there, you'll see we were budgeted 682,000, came in 196,000, which since we weren't able to host some of the rec pack programs is certainly no surprise. As part of this also, we are requesting to carry over some encumbered items about $445,000 worth of carryover items. And when we move into the fund 80,000 items shortly, you know, some of this available money that we're returning back to the county here will be something that we'll be getting back uh, shortly in the revenue fund. So just, uh, just mention that to you up front. Any questions on the general fund? Are, are you taking our silence as, as questions? Yes, uh, as, uh, if there's any questions or anything like that, absolutely. I know obviously you had to vote on it too, but questions are happy to answer questions now also. While we're waiting, just a point of order, did we vote on adopting the uh, previous minutes? We'll go back and do that, Tim. Thank you. Yep. Everybody's paying attention because I got practically notes from everybody that says you need to do that. Linwood? I'm sorry. I was just. No question? No. Okay. All right. Seeing that there are no questions, is there a. I made the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. Motion carries. We will go back now to admin item number three, which is the adoption of the minutes from the July 8th, 25th authority <coughs> board meeting. Is there a second? That's Tim Hackman, I second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. All right, back to action items. Action item number two is the FY 2020 carryover budget review, 2000, which is the park revenue and operating fund. Back to Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Barrett again. And if you don't mind, if you could bring up that attachment. Uh, and as that's coming up, I do want to mention, obviously, for the revenue fund, uh, this is certainly the most difficult year that we've had in the revenue fund you know, since I've worked for the park authority. And while there's no way to make up coming up short, you know, revenue by 20 some million dollars that you see here, I did want to kind of uh, point out some key steps that we did do throughout the year uh, to give credit to staff to the actions that the Park Authority Board took and also our partners, the Department of Management and Budget actually ever taking too to help us. And some of those things that we did to help ourselves is we came into FY20 after a difficult 19, so we had some funding controls in place. So that certainly helped us, you know, do fairly well this year. Uh, kudos to Golf and his team, uh, Todd and his team at Golf. Uh, Golf had a fantastic last couple months, and we actually had to raise the revenue projections there a couple times. Uh, the board took action earlier to move revenues from 18 and 19 into the revenue fund, and then later in the year to move FY20 revenues into the revenue fund. So those, again, were key actions that helped the revenue fund do as good as it did in a difficult year. I'll also mention that we were able to move $1.7 million worth of expenditures from the revenue fund over to CARES projects. So that certainly also helped the revenue fund. 
And then they're actually working with the Department of Management and Budget. They're going to be transferring in $1.7 million as we move into FY21 to help, you know, as we start FY21 with a negative balance to help correct that. So it's a really is a partnership of a lot of different things. And we also, the board took action to approve the use of the reserve and $2.6 million. And we will be taking advantage and using that also. So just kind of, you know, a lot of steps and things that happen to help us navigate where we are now. But what you have in front of you right now is just a snapshot on attachment one of looking at fiscal year FY20. Uh, obviously a very difficult year. Revenue came in $20 million under budget. Uh, of course, we lost all of the fourth quarter, which as some of the other presentations is really the most profitable quarter for us. So we lost all that camp revenue you know, opening up a golf there for a while, the lake parks, the water mine, all that was lost revenue. Uh, however, in expenditures, we also came in under budget there. So we did some things to kind of really help ourselves uh, navigate through the year by putting in those controls and moving those costs, uh, so forth. Uh, so as we mentioned, though, somewhat, we, we ended the year in a negative posture of about $6.9 million. We kind of look at FY20 as a snapshot. And if Hannah can bring up, you know, the second attachment, which is really more of the fun statement, it kind of will show us how we ended the year for one. We know in the ending balance, Hannah, if you could just roll down a little bit farther down where you can see it, we ended the year here with a negative $3.3 million in FY20 based on our starting balances, the actions that we took, the short, you know, revenue, the controls and expenditures. And then hand up, sorry if we can roll up a little bit just so we can kind of see FY21, where we started the year with a negative balance of $3.3 million based on our operations. And then you'll see there kind of in the second level down a transfer in. We're expecting a transfer in of the general fund of about $1.7 million. That is really where the county is giving back to us some of the savings that we got in FY20. Those savings coming back in then allow us as we move through the year based on our expenditures to end the year, which we kind of see there at the bottom at a zero balance. So we kind of start the year negative, but with the transfer in and based on our operations and adopted budget, we'll end the year with a zero balance. And I will mention too, that the FY21 budget is currently based on the adopted budget. Uh, we are certainly pretty confident at some point we'll have to go back to the Board of Supervisors and to the Park Authority Board and make some revisions to this budget. Uh, we just don't know at this point when that will be. And so that really won't be until we get some clarity on when will our sites be open? Will we be having camps you know, next summer and so forth? But obviously, we'll have to make some adjustments to that FY21 budget at some point later. So it kind of we ended up, you know, 20 in, in a disappointing shape, but not, you know, certainly unexpected given that we're closed during a very busy time. But with the actions that we took with help from DMB, we will end FY21, which from the county perspective, you know, or like any businesses, some businesses lose money in a given year but they continue operations. And that's really is what we are doing and what we are focusing on for FY21. So we will end the year FY21 with a zero balance. Uh, as staff, we will continue to work with management budget and identify future opportunities that we might have to move costs over to the CARES funding. So I just kind of want to make that well known. And that CARES funding will be available for any expenditures also that are incurred through uh, December 30th of this year. So that's kind of a, a somewhat of a, a highlight here on you know, the revenue fund. Uh, any questions? Ken? I don't have any questions, but I just want to underline a couple of things that Mike has said, and that's just to give kudos to our own staff and management, as well as the folks across the street that work with us in meeting a challenge that was quite formidable. And uh, I think uh, you just did a great job. I, I couldn't agree more. You, you guys have done a fantastic job. And for us to, at this point, only come up three and a half million dollars short is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, outstanding. 
outstanding work. It is certainly it was a very collect. I'm sorry, a very collaborative effort, as we both of you noted, between staff. The Park Authority Board took some incredible actions throughout the year. DMB to end up where he is. So thank you very much for that. You're welcome. Any other board members comments? I can't see everybody at this point because of the presentation. Uh, okay, Ron. Yeah, I just have a, a a question as to the, I guess the, the need to build back the reserve. I understand we're probably going to have a negative number, or potentially going to have a negative number to zero next year, which doesn't include replenishing that reserve. I think the discussions with the county level have to include that reserve because we have to have some some emergency funds available for things that are just going to happen that we cannot predict beyond the, the current pandemic. And, and Ron, I'll, I'll just interject Mike Barrett again speaking that that is part of an ongoing conversation that we are having with DMB. Uh, again, we will continue to look for costs that can be moved to this CARES funding, and it will be certainly something that we have during our meetings with DMB, the chief financial officer, have uh, stressed the importance of that reserve. And as you mentioned, of course, FY21 is going to be a very difficult year. So we will work with them to hopefully get some monies to replenish that to help us navigate uh, another very difficult year, unfortunately. Mike? Yes, sir. Mike Thompson. Uh, sorry, this is, this is Mike Thompson, Mike. Um, when do, I, I just, I can't recall when the payments on the golf courses, there's, there's one that comes up in what, 2021 or 2023, something like that? Yeah. Right, Mike Baird here. Yes, you're correct. The final for the Twin Lakes and Oakmark debt service will be this year, FY21. That will all be paid off really by the end of this calendar year. So that debt will come off. So that will certainly help us. It won't help us in 21, but it will help us moving forward from there. Right. All right. If there's no other discussion, is there a second for the motion? Ken Quincy, I second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Say nay. The motion carries. Countywide, A3, FY 2020 carryover budget review fund 30400 which is the Park Authority Bond Construction Fund. Mike, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mike Baird here again. Hannah, if you don't mind, if you could bring up that fund statement. And this one, you know, at least we're getting back to stuff that you know is a pretty familiar for all the board. Uh, this is a it was a very good year for the Park Authority bond. Uh, we sold twenty five million dollars worth of bonds back in February, or actually nineteen million dollars worth of bonds, and we got six million dollars worth of bond premium, which is fantastic. And that will be one of the key things, really, as part of this carryover submission, is to request the appropriation of that six million dollars. And I will kind of just mention to uh, Tim Hackman and had some questions about the appropriation of those dollars. And the project we pick for that is a project consistent with where we have done that you know, appropriation before and will certainly allow us to do any of the board's direction to use that bond premium for land acquisition or any other items as the board votes and approves on. So that will not be impacted whatsoever, but this will just make those dollars available to fund those board actions. Uh, we will go into FY21 uh, with a budget appropriation of $84.3 million. Great. Any Comments? questions? Questions? Great job again, Mike. Really, really great job by everybody. Thank you. All right. I don't see anybody. So is there a motion is there a second to the motion to approve? And Quincy, I second the second. motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Both say nay. Motion carries. Countywide A4 is the uh, FY 2020 carryover budget review fund 80,300, which is the park improvement fund. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Mike Barrett again here. 
This is another one of the funds that is you know, under the fiduciary control of the Park Authority Board. Uh, and this fund, a, a couple of key things here, I really one of the main key things I do want to mention is that we have a partnership here. And yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up. My apologies here. Uh, we do have the fund statement and the fund statement kind of highlights it right there in the middle. Uh, we are doing a expect a transfer in from the housing department of $1.5 million. And this will be part of a partnership that we are having on North Hill Park. So the park authority is matching those dollars. And this is a match from the housing authority. They are transferring the money to us. We'll be putting it into a project. And then those funds will be available as we move forward to design and construct that park. Uh, behind that, I think Hannah just showed it is some of a busy one, so we'll kind of quite skip it for now, but a spreadsheet of really all the projects, and I would suggest if any board members have any questions with some of the projects, I know sometimes some of these are pretty near and dear to certain board members, uh, to please reach out to me, be happy to go over these. Uh, the key thing that we'll note some of, the, some of these things is uh, like monopole money, since we move most of the mon monopole money into the revenue fund, what you see here is a fairly skinned up version than what we would normally do. So what we are funding here is some, the WPFO to cover some of the planning staff and say for like Lee district, we have monies in there to cover the splash park area that we normally would fund from here. Uh, the park proffers where we got out $2 million that we're seeking to appropriate. And then the $1.5 million transfer in from North Hill and Hannah, if you don't mind, maybe just go to the next spreadsheet, which is probably a little bit easier to demonstrate some of the actions here. Right here, and we, Hannah's just kind of we're just rolling through it, but these are just some of the projects that we are seeking to increase the appropriation. And actually, Hannah, if you stop right there, highlight another thing. The board had taken action at the end of last year to close out the catastrophic events project, and it's right there at the very top. Uh, to move that $250,000 since we really aren't using that project. It, it was a good idea when we first set it up, but the need just never really became apparent. So we are closing that project out and moving that into the director's emergency reserve uh, to make those funds available for the director if something comes up. So it was a perfect stopping point right there. But then we were also appropriating, you know, the, the North Hill funding, the park proffers, uh, so forth. So here's kind of the actions that we're taking as part of this carryover. And that really kind of hits on the highlights for fund 80300 Park Improvement Fund. Any questions here? Any questions from anybody? Mr. Chairman, this is Mike Thompson. Yes, sir. Um, Mike, I just want to point out for, for anybody out there that might be watching, and thank the Park Foundation for the money they gave for Burke Lake for the shelters that was highlighted on that previous document, which made that possible. So I just want to thank the foundation for their work on that. Thanks, Mike. Any other comments? All right. Is there a second to the motion to approve? And Quincy, I second the motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay, and motion carries. In the Braddock District, um, we have approval, Lake Akatink Parks, Pollinator Garden, naming the Pollinator Garden, honoring Margaret Kinder. Is there any discussion? Kyle? I just uh, move approval. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay, motion carries. All right, we're on to information items. Countywide information item number one is the uh, Golf Enterprises update, and we'll go from Todd Johnson. Thank you, uh, Todd Johnson here, uh, manager of Golf Enterprises. Uh, we also have on the line tonight Nick DeRay, uh, the marketing specialist for the agency, and Roberta Corzin the golf marketing specialist as well on the line. Uh, and Hannah will bring up the presentation here in a second. Uh, the presentation tonight is really just to tell you about how things are going in golf, whether it be the golf industry, uh, how things are going uh, locally in golf and talk about um, the impacts of COVID-19 
and how we've responded to that. Anna, you can go to the next slide. So this slide um, is pretty dramatic, shows you the number of golf participants dating back to the year 2000. Uh, ma many articles um, have been written about this graph and the impact of Tiger Woods on this graph. Um, his Tiger Woods won his first major tournament in 1997 and his last in 2008, which is also about the time that the um, economy, of course, went the wrong direction. So, um, you know, a lot of discussion about the golf participation and how it's been tailing off, you know, since around 2005 to eight in that range. Um, but of course, now we've seen an uptick uh, in 2018 and 19. So there's some positive uh, things going on, on in golf that we're seeing in participation. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So one of the great things that's going on for us that impacts us that we're seeing nationally is the, the number of beginners. Um, we're positioned well as our facilities are generally designed for beginners. We have par three facilities, driving ranges, nine holes, uh, facilities that are all very attractive and appropriate for beginning golfers. And we're seeing that in youth participation and lots of beginners that continue to utilize our facilities to get introduced to the game. Uh, we can go to the next slide. So I talked about, brief, mentioned briefly a second ago about the uptick uh, that occurred in 2019. So this slide shows how we did as compared uh, to the DC market. Uh, as you can see in 2019, we had a, a very good year um, and we continue to see, um, so that was the calendar year, which would have represented the end of the second half of fiscal year 19 and the first half of fiscal year 20, which were both very, very strong performance in our, uh, in golf enterprises for the park authority. You can go on to the next slide. So this is another uh, graph that shows the slight uptick recently. Um, we had a very wet, um, year in 2018, a little bit into 2019, not as much locally, and we started to see the increase in participation. Uh, next slide. So one thing to always keep in mind when we're talking um, about our golf operations is that we're very fortunate um, that we're in one of the strongest golf economies in the United States. Um, reasons uh, include the number of facilities um, we have the perfect population and demographics for golf. We have a great number of participants, uh, the supply composition, sort of the breakdown of private versus public golf courses. Um, the revenue per, per available round is very strong. And you see on the slide there, our utilization is very strong as well. There is a slight oversupply in golf courses, um, but that's improved uh, dramatically um, over the, the period in which you saw the, the downturn uh, nationally. So you can go on to the next slide. So this, you know, how do we keep all these beginners? You know, how do we engage them? How do we make them regular golfers is always a goal that we're always constantly discussing. Our strategy um, and the board's, really your strategy as a board, um, you know, dating back 10 or 15 years ago was that you guys recognized that we needed to reinvest in the facilities. Um, that was the feedback that we got from the NGF study. Um, we made the golf operations and the facilities, the infrastructure a priority in the bonds 2012 and 16. And now we're starting to see um, the benefit of improve, of updating the facilities, particularly Burke Lake and Oakmar. Um, and that really enables us to um, to do well with the beginners and um, at our driving range facilities. Um, you can move on to the next slide. So I wanted to talk uh, recent, uh, recent events. So COVID-19's effects on golf, um, you know, it was mid-March when everything kind of shut down. Um, the state of Commonwealth of Virginia, we never technically were required to close our golf courses, but many a very high percentage did. 
Um, those, the loss of golf rounds from mid-March to May 1st were about 20 million golf rounds nationally. Um, locally, you know, as I'll talk more about in a little bit here, is that we've had a very strong um, rebound once we reopened. Our facilities ended up being closed anywhere from eight to 10 weeks, and we've seen um, quite a dramatic increase in rounds. It's approximately 36% in those uh, first five weeks that we reopened. And you can see nationwide, it's, a, it's also uh, has had a similar effect nationwide. In the month of May, there was an additional 2.4 million rounds versus uh, May of 19. You can go on to the next slide. So what we're hearing from our staff and we're seeing at our golf courses is that you know, the avid or the frequent golfers are all playing. But in addition to that, we're seeing lots of beginners. We're getting people that are both new to our facilities as well as golfers that are new to the game. Staff is sharing that they're giving directions to the first tee more than they've ever uh, can remember in recent times. So that's a, pot, a great thing for us is that we're getting new folks to our facilities. Go to the next slide. So talking about what our, so I mentioned earlier, we were closed March 16th to our first three golf facilities reopened May 8th. What we did during that time is a lot of planning. We made sure that our facilities were safe for both the staff, volunteers, and the golfers when we were ready to reopen. We um, had to determine what guidelines, there was a lot of safety protocols and rules being developed in guidelines during that time period, we decided to go with a nationally recognized um, agency, the National Golf Course Owners Association and their park and play program, um, which is applied at ma many golf courses across the nation. Staff developed site specific uh, procedures, you know, your typical circles and X's and stuff on the floor to respect social distancing and to be able to get the golfers in and out of the clubhouse as quickly as possible and out onto the golf course. Um, one of the recommendations from Park and Play was that you try to, to get the customers to pay in advance uh, prior to coming to the golf course. That's not something we offered prior to um, the COVID closing. So we partnered with Golf Now and we have our full inventory um, on their website as well for the first time where we've offered our, our T-sheet through Easy Links as well as through Golf Now. So that's had a great positive impact and also is um, contributed to the introduction of new golfers to our facilities. And of course, during that time we were closed, we purchased all the proper uh, PPE equipment and cleaning supplies uh, for our staff so that we could operate safely. Next slide, please. So like I mentioned earlier, we opened three, we started opening in early May. We opened three facilities May 8th, three on May 15th, and three on May, or two on May 22nd. Um, right away, we saw the pent up demand and I mean, it was like day one, they were back. Um, they were eagerly anticipating us reopening and they, the numbers were, the participation numbers and utilization were very high right away. Um, our, we did, a, had a great return rate on our part-time staff and volunteers. Um, the ones that didn't come back right away, talked to their friends who did and then, or visited the site, made sure that they felt safe and they have now also joined us. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this without the support of other parts of the agency as well as the county. If you're not familiar, we had rec center folks um, from the front desk of a rec center would be working at the front desk of Greendale, for example, and pretty much all of our facilities, 30 plus employees um, from the rec centers that we would not have been able to operate as we were under a county hiring freeze we had to um, rely on employees part-time and full-time. In the county, neighborhood, neighborhood and community services in particular provided uh, several employees who ended up working on our maintenance side of our operation, um, which was invaluable as we weren't able to hire people right in the peak of when we would typically be hiring our seasonal employees. Um, Roberta did a great job. Um, constantly communicating with our customers, which I'll speak a little bit more about in a second. Um, and it's resulted in record rounds, buckets, and revenue uh, over the last eight to 10 weeks. 
Uh, like I mentioned, the four were first four weeks up 38% in the number of rounds and rounds revenue and buckets. You know, it's range buckets of balls um, at our facilities are up 21%. Um, and, and we're experiencing lots of new golfers, which is great, great for our facilities. Next slide. So Roberta's efforts um, with communications, we've on we engage the customers throughout the closure, which is critical to um, you know front of brain so that they are ready to come back when we reopen. We kept in communication with them. We told them what we were doing to prepare to be safe for their return. We told them about the maintenance that was occurring and the projects. We took advantage of the closure to knock out some maintenance projects that were uh, overdue. And we then communicated um, on our new system of tee times how we were doubling our efforts on availability for tee times with Golf Now as we reopened. And those resulted in our database is up, our golf rounds through Golf Now that we wouldn't have had in the past are doing well. And we also, Roberta was a big player in us once the hiring freeze was lifted for us at the end of June to hire part time employees. Um, we been able to see their 65% of those positions have been filled in a very short period of time. Next slide. And you'll see the next slide, all metrics. Um, we talked about revenue and buckets being up. Our pass sale, which is typically exactly when we were closed, our annual pass sale where we sell five, 10 and 15 round passes would typically have happened from mid-March to mid-May, exactly when we were closed. What we did is we moved that to the first um, approximately six or seven weeks that we were reopened. And those past sales ended up being up 10% over last year's numbers for the um, same amount of sales period. In all the metrics, when it comes to social media, um, thanks to Roberta engaging golfers, um, the clicks are up, the our followers on uh, Twitter are up, everything is, you know, we're getting lots of attention and it's showing um, on the golf course with the increased numbers. Uh, next slide. So I want to, and you can go on to the next slide, just per, do an overall sort of how we're doing um, as relates to the last six years. Real quick, I'll go through this. So you can see here, we, on 2015-16, the net revenue for golf enterprises was right around approximately $500,000. And then we entered sort of the investment period uh, that I'll call it 2017, 18, 19, where we did the renovation projects at Burke Lake, Twin Lakes, Oakmar, uh, which were significant projects um, that we were necessary for the aging infrastructure. But at the time, they had a, definitely an impact on revenue. Um, it's like a quick example with Oakmar, we those four months at close was probably a four hundred thousand dollar, approximately four hundred thousand dollars swing. So we felt a little bit of pain during those three years, but it's was really paying off. Um, calendar year nineteen, which is the end of fiscal nineteen, um, and then of course the second half of calendar nineteen, which is the beginning of fiscal twenty. We the, we had a great calendar year nineteen. Revenue was up, rounds were up, buckets were up. And that's reflected. Um, we, I would have projected that in if we had not closed for those eight or ten weeks in fiscal year twenty, our gross revenue was headed towards about eleven million. Um, our our net some, would have been somewhere probably between seven hundred thousand and a million. So all that investment in the facilities, um, as I had said to Sarah many times, it was the no, no excuses year. All the work had been done, all the infrastructure had been updated. Um, there was nothing that was going to have a negative impact on revenue. And we were, and the weather had definitely cooperated. So we were having a great year up until we closed. And then once we've returned, it's we've had record weeks ever since. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to briefly go over this. So the this is the numbers. So it shows you sort of the same information. The number of rounds in two, this is. Uh, fiscal year 20, um, despite being closed for eight to 10 weeks, depending on the facility, our number of rounds were up. And same with buckets. So it's basically flat, but that's miraculous to be able to do despite being closed eight to 10 weeks. Uh, next slide. So site by site, 
Burke Lake, you can see uh, the investment was in 2005. And then immediately, 2000, sorry, the investment at Burke Lake was 2017 and 18 are the fiscal years that it impacted it being the clubhouse and the range being closed for short periods of time. Um, resulted in 2019 fully operational. We made, you know, it was a net of $251,000. Uh, next slide. Greendale, we've made small incremental um, investments over the years. Uh, recently, the parking lot, but we had a, a project in uh, Dave's group where we uh, did uh, drainage improvements on hole number 17. We replaced the irrigation system. It's constant investment, which has paid off, and that's why Greendale's been a, a strong performer throughout. Next slide. Jefferson District, a um, lot of investment right now ongoing in the park and the golf course, and I would anticipate that we'll see a spike uh, moving forward there. But you can see that Jefferson's always a strong performer. Next slide. Laurel Hill's been a little bit more of a roller coaster, um, but the recent, uh, we had definitely had investment over the early years of this slide uh, now, which have resulted in strong recent financial performance. Next slide. Uh, Oakmar, you see the year, uh, fiscal year 19, where we were closed. I mentioned about the $400,000 impact. Now we've reopened um, and that 172,000 net this Fiscal year obviously was seriously impacted by COVID, would have been a much bigger number. Uh, next slide. Um, Pinecrest. So, you know, we've done a lot, quite a bit of investment, um, 2017, 18, um, where we invested in the clubhouse, um, which is increasing our program revenue, as well as we the money from the simulator. Um, you can see it's, it's been slower to build, but we're, we're, it's been on the improve the last three years. And I would anticipate um, Pinecrest is probably the biggest um, improvement uh, since we've reopened post COVID. Their numbers have been um, through the roof at Pinecrest. Next slide. And Twin Lakes, uh, another one where it's a perfect example, the investment, the bunkering project where we had nine holes closed at that 36 hole facility during fiscal year 18. And then now you see how we've built up those utilization numbers uh, ever since we did that improvement at Twin Lakes. Uh, next slide. So things moving forward that we're working on, we'll continue um, to uh, Roberta and Nick, um, new creative marketing initiatives um, moving forward. As it relates to marketing, we're going to be replacing our point of sale system um, with, which, uh, with a system that will give us new additional marketing tools. Um, we'll continue to uh, recruit and try to attract junior women and new golfers to our facilities, uh, implement some dynamic pricing at the facilities where that makes sense, and consider to um, alternative staff approaches. So I didn't you know, I mentioned and I, most of the credit goes to the reinvestment in our facilities as it relates to the recent strong performance in golf, but also at the same time, you know, we have um, tried to shift the model um, since the 2012 NGF work that recommended that we needed to have less, less merit staff and more part-time staff. Um, we have approximately 25% less merit staff in golf than we did in 2000. 12 and 13, um, that definitely has a positive effect on the um, bottom line. So that is it for the presentation. Um, I am available for questions as well as Nick DeRay and Roberta, if you have any questions. Good job, really good job. Thank you. Lots of, lots of improvement. Any, uh, any questions, any comments from the board, Ron? Um, just quick, I think the, the, the key to that, uh, one of those first introductory slides on the safety of the staff and the volunteers and the customers is probably the key to why golf is moving in the direction it's moving for us now uh, within the pandemic. Um, people need to feel comfortable when they come to the course. And I think the things that we put in place 
the distancing, the face shields, the face masks inside the facilities has all worked really well. Uh, I also think a lot of the online activity that we've seen can be supported with additional stuff that you're probably already planning to do. Um, I really see the the passes as being potentially a a future push because people will want to buy multiple passes at a discount at a course, and then the money's in our pocket whether they use them or not. Um, we want them to use them, but we'd rather have the money up front. Uh, I'd like to know if we have any way of knowing what the reservation system is allowing people to do when they don't show up, uh, the no-show uh, numbers. For people who reg reserved the tea time and didn't show up, we expected them to come and pay, but maybe they never came out too hot, too rainy, too whatever. I'd like to know if we could find that number somewhere in the the, the grainy details of the data. Yeah, yeah. So two quick quick thoughts on no shows. Um, so golf now is their prepayment. We've had a very have had great success um, with those people showing up because they prepaid. Um, and in addition to that, at this time we took advantage of this opportunity to change the rules, and we went from seven day advanced tea times to seven day advanced tea time. And that's also positively impacted the, the number of no shows has definitely gone down quite a bit. Great. Anybody else? Kyle? Todd, that uh, oversupply of golf course number was the US as a whole, correct? Correct. And what do we have any idea what it's like in our region? Um, I can, I'll work with Nick and I can get you those numbers. It's definitely, it's slightly oversupplied, but nothing compared to the national numbers. Okay. Cause that's an insane number. Yes. Okay. Run. Yeah. Just a follow on. Do we have any way of knowing what uh, Northern Virginia Regional is doing with numbers? Uh, something to compare us to? Um, I do not. I have not talked to them, um, but that is something uh, that we now have access to their information through uh, some data sharing that we're doing. So I can look into that. Um, I would I would assume they're doing a similar uh effort but i'll check in i'll work i'll look into that and i'll report back to you okay anybody else thank you good job very very good all right countywide information item number two we're going to talk about the bond and judy's going to give us an update well good evening everybody it's nice to see you and um, I also want to say that Dave Bowden is still on the line in case there's any questions about the bond. Um, really, what I'm going to talk about is how we're going to educate the public and also a little bit about your role as advocates. Uh, Hannah, um, again, this is Judy Peterson. I'm the public information officer. Um, could you start the slides? There we are. So parks are for everyone, the 2020 park bond. And um, next slide, please. This is what our bond is going to look like this time. And those are the 100 million uh, breakouts. Next slide, please. And we have a rich history of bond passage uh, going back from 1959 when it was a $4 million uh, bond all the way to the 94.7 million in 2016. Um, I think that uh, we're going to continue that trend um, although I certainly wouldn't advocate, I would just say that that is a factual statement. <laughs> uh, next uh, slide, please. So um, I wanted to talk just a moment about education versus advocacy. Um, I've been working with County Attorney um, Aaron Ward 
to ensure that uh, that those lines are clear. And so um, I just wanted to state that, you know, Park Authority staff can educate and uh, the public and supported parties uh, can pro be provided with uh, educational materials regarding the 2020 Park bond. Next slide, please. Now that is different, of course, uh, from uh, from those who are not park staff. So park staff cannot advocate for the 2020 park bond. Next slide, please. So what are we doing to get the word out? And um, I believe I heard that we're about 100 days away from the election. Um, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, that's not a whole lot of time. So we are developing and starting to implement a public education program. And we're trying to use all the tools in the toolbox, but uh, it's a little different uh, during the pandemic because some of the things that we would ordinarily do in terms of going out to the community to hold meetings, um, even just getting our signs out has a little bit of a uh, challenge to it. Um, for example, we looked into bus advertising, which uh, has been used before, but at this time only about 30% of the buses are actually running and the ridership is very low. So. Um, you know, we, we have to look at some different means by which we can uh, make this happen. So our focus is in large measure on digital means of communication. Um, our website has been up now for about a month. I would encourage people to, to look at it and also uh, know that we're going to continue to add material to it as more material becomes available. Uh, we also looked at social media from a couple of different perspectives and after speaking with uh, several people who really understand uh, social media advertising uh, in today's day and age. We decided that we would uh, start out first with organic and see where that took us. Uh, there's a lot of um, difficulty in political advertising right now. And um, even, you know, going with the Park Foundation on that end, we weren't sure that that was, was the right way to go. Our organic reach is fairly large and gets um, picked up by others, so we think that we can do it with organic. Uh, virtual meetings, we'll be asking uh, uh, HOAs and civic organizations if they'd like us to go online through a Zoom or uh, through WebEx to uh, educate them on the bond. We're also working with the county. Um, we've had crews out for the last two weeks uh, creating video content that uh, shows the type of projects and some of the projects that are uh, programmed for the bond. And uh, we're developing information sheets, including district by district talking points uh, for advocates. So um, if you wanna know what's happening in this district, uh, we can tell you. Uh, we already have a PowerPoint that is up online and that could be presented um, easily by anybody to anybody. And, um, and then, of course, we'll be looking to the youth groups, sport associations, friends groups, HOAs, um, to, uh, to get them to, you know, with a push of a button, touch several thousand people and let them know the facts about the bond. Next slide, please. So uh, the green team, uh, a few folks on the board who have not um, really been involved with some of the, the bonds in the past were asking me about the green team. So, I wanted to explain what it is that these individuals, whether they're an advocate group that is separate or whether they end up being part of the park board, um, they develop and implement the outreach education plans that, um, that provides um, the information. The difference is, of course, um, advocates can advocate and we can't. Um, and so you really become an ambassador and you lobby on behalf of the, of the bond utilizing information that we provide um, and also the park, uh, the park authority in general, just knowledge of our, of our organization. And I do want to say that the Park Foundation um, is funding all of the materials. Um, we, they've just invested in some signs, very significant cost. And, um, and so that's a very important point that, um, that those dollars are going for that. Next slide, please. Just some other outreach highlights. Um, we'll be coordinating with Nova Parks uh, because they do have a piece of the bond as well. Uh, we'll be coordinating the dissemination of the park bond signs. Uh, you'll notice our bond signs are a little different this time and that'll be on our next slide. 
uh, half are uh, advocacy and the other are, are, are education. Um, we'll be encouraging the development of blogs, letters to the editor, other traditional means of communication. Um, we'll see as we get closer if we can find an inch uh, to get in with some editorial boards uh, to talk to them, educate them, perhaps have a press briefing. And, um, and then we're, of course, supporting the county's bond education efforts through working with them on the video, as well as uh, refining the language right now on, on the flyer that will go to all the households in the county. Next slide, please. And so I mentioned that there are uh, two different types of signage. Um, one simply says, you know, where you can find it and that there is a 2020 park bond and the other is an advocacy piece. Next slide, please. I will take any questions if there are any. Can't hear you, Bill. Bill. All right, get off mute, Bill. Um, it's going to be really, really critical this year, um, just because of the situation that we're in. So I would ask that the board play a more active role this year. And in the past, we've been able to go out and and uh, and get a, a team captain to run the green team, and and I'm not really sure how feasible that is this year because it's going to be more of a virtual presence um, than anything else. So I would ask that, you know, if we could, if we extend ourselves a little bit, make ourselves available some, for some of these meetings, because we're just not going to be able to get out there and get those grassroots efforts like we have in the past. So please give that consideration. Judy will be in touch with everybody. Uh, Mike, you had something to say? Mike Thompson. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. This is Mike Thompson. Judy, <clears throat> I know that you you were looking at doing a mostly organic social media program. Mm -hmm. um, I can I, I would just recommend um, that if there's an entity that may do the advert uh, paid advertising, specifically for example on Facebook, in support of this, they have to file for a disclaimer, and that disclaimer can take several weeks, and sometimes Facebook gets backed up. I would strongly recommend that that any group that might be identified to do that support work that an effort be made to get that disclaimer, whether you choose to use whether you choose to do the ads or not, is a different issue. But if you decide you want to do it on October first, you may not have the time to actually implement a campaign. Yes, we uh, we explored that, and um, right now getting those disclaimers and getting those permissions extremely difficult. Um, the requirement for personal information to be um, divulged. Uh, so we didn't really have any takers when we asked, well, guys, would you like to do this? So, um, I, but I would agree that we probably need to do a little more exploration just in case we need to go down that path and we'll, we'll immediately. But um, I, I'm very confident that our organic reach on all of our platforms and through the green team um, is gonna suffice. I understand. I was just, I was just suggesting you might want to. Thank you. Good. Anybody else? Well, Judy will be in touch with us for sure um, in the coming weeks, and um, and we'll we'll go out there and give it our best again. Thanks, Judy, for all your work. Appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. All right, uh, countywide A6, we're going to have a discussion about uh, policy 405, which are the signs. Judy, you're going right. to I am. Um, and uh, so back in January 24th, 2018, uh, the Park Board approved policy 405, which deals with signs and displays. And um, the policy provides guidance in terms of protecting um, the aesthetic of the parkland and facilities under its control or ownership. My name, by the way, is Judy Peterson, and I'm the public information officer. Uh, now, since that approval, you know, several changes and additions to the document have been recommended. 
uh, to better facilitate free speech on park authority property. I'll go into some of those changes first, but let me also add that uh, Sarah Baldwin, who is the deputy director for the park authority, will be uh, participating in this presentation. And we also are, are lucky enough to have the uh, county attorney, um, Cynthia Bailey with us. Um, she will um, be going into closed session later on this evening with you to talk about some of the nuances, but um, she's also listening and available in case there are any questions about the uh, sign display areas. So uh, some of the changes that uh, are going to be talked about tonight, seek to clarify the type of signage that requires a permit, um, highlights the differences between public speech versus park authority speech, um, such as interpretive signage, and addresses issues pertaining to uh, what we find as a growing uh, request for sign placement in the community. Next slide, please. So, we uh, are not only anticipating, but we are um, experiencing increased requests uh, for park signage. We have to acknowledge that uh, parks are a public forum, a traditional public forum. Uh, that signage within the parks, we believe, uh, is in need of management. Um, and key to all of these discussions is the um, absolute need to remain content neutral. Next slide, please. So I mentioned uh, the kind of forum that we are. There's the non-public forum, limited public forum, and the traditional public forum. And when you look at those buckets, we are that last bucket, the traditional public forum. That's where speech is taking place. And that's one of the questions that you have to ask first and foremost. Next slide, please. So what is a traditional public forum? Well, parks. We are definitely a traditional public forum, sidewalks, streets, and then I won't read them, but you can see some of the limited public forums and the non-public forums. Um, those are also important just in terms of comparison. Next slide, please. So again, we need to focus on the fact that regulations absolutely have to be content neutral. Um, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, in terms of the type of content, you, you can't treat them differently. Uh, it can never be based on subject matter. And uh, it can't be based on the fact that we may disagree with the message. Um, I don't know, at uh, Lewinsville Park for the farmer's market, I often get calls after the farmer's market because uh, there is one gentleman there who has very large signs uh, and he is espousing support for one particular uh, candidate and people call up and they're just outraged that we allow them to have that signage. Um, and of course, you can't target the messenger. Next slide, please. So uh, again, when we talk about content, content neutrality, it doesn't mean that it's completely the Wild West. We are allowed to have some controls. So we can control time, place, and manner. So we can say that uh, you can only put a sign on the plaza or that you have to keep off the grass um, or that you can't um, you know, block the front of the building. And we can tell you when you can do this. We can say signs must be removed one hour after an event. And, and we can say again that you can't create a safety hazard um, or in the case of um, other First Amendment activities, we can, we can regulate the number of people we can say that it can't be uh, anything besides acoustic music, and we can regulate the size of the signs. So that's the approach that we've taken. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to Sarah, and the next slide, please. Sarah Baldwin, uh, Deputy Director. Um, uh, I'm, the next uh, couple of slides are going to walk you through the elements within the policy. Um, the first element within the policy is the purpose statement. Um, and we've expanded the purpose statement to uh, talk directly to our role um, in protecting uh, First Amendment rights um, of individuals who wish to express themselves within parks while ensuring that we're maintaining the aesthetics of, of parkland. Next slide, please. Um, the, the first real element within the slide uh, um, in the policy 
discusses temporary signs. Um, we all are very concerned in making sure um, and as well as the public doesn't want to go to a park and see a park covered in different signs. However, temporary signs are, are necessary for our operational um, uh, needs within the park. Examples of temporary signs may be directional signs for a group that's hosting a 5K within the park, um, an event that's being hosted in the park. It, Glow would be an example of the signage that they put up at Lake Fairfax during their event, or a temporary sign may be a directional sign to a family reunion that's being held in a, in a shelter at Burke Lake. All of these are necessary, um, but what the policy does, it defines the length of time the sign can be within the park, um, where the sign can be placed, um, and the, 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 um, the maximum size of the sign. Next slide, please. One of the other new elements within the uh, policy is related to the sign display areas. Um, to ensure we keep with the aesthetic nature of the park and to help to ensure that parks aren't littered with signs, we've outlined sign display areas at each park. So of all of the parks that we have in the system, staff have gone through and identified a sign display area. Typically, this is about 20 feet from the park entrance sign. Um, and so the policy outlines um, the location of where these signs can go, the length of time the signs can be within the park, of course, that the, um, the fact that we must remain content neutral in terms of what is displayed on that sign. Um, and it also outlines the frequency in which we remove the signs. Um, we know that we have the ability to uh, regulate the length of time the sign was within the park. Um, so we've set some parameters um, that outlines for the individuals that would like to put a sign in the park when those signs would, would be picked up by park authority staff or when they need to remove those signs. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the next um, element within the policy um, are kiosks. Um, and as anyone who's visited a park has seen kiosks throughout the park. Um, the kiosks really further demonstrate our commitment to meeting the obligation of providing um, a traditional public forum uh, for, for First Amendment activities within the park. Um, additionally, kiosks have been historically placed in parks in partnerships with community groups. Um, so through the policy, um, we have identified certain kiosks that will be community use kiosks. Um, and those kiosks would have anything from lost dog announcements, lost cat announcements, a community event flyer that may be happening nearby. Um, and we would add a disclaimer on those kiosks that the park authority does not endorse any of the messages that are on the kiosks. If you look at park systems nationally, kiosks are, are a great way for the community to communicate on what's going on. It's often a gathering space in communities um, to communicate with one another. So we felt having the ability for the community to you know, put messages on kiosks with some management parameters in terms of the size um, of the materials that they could put on the kiosk, the number of messages that they could put on, and then, of course, parameters for how long they'll stay up um, was important, again, to show our commitment to uh, the First Amendment and our role in that. Next slide, please. The next element of the policy relates to interpretive signage. Oftentimes, the park authority is approached by different groups who would like to install interpretive signage in the parks to interpret um, a historical events that occurred in the area, um, to recognize an individual that may have contributed to that area, um, or to interpret about the natural resources. Um, what the policy does in terms of interpretive science is really puts the ownership on the park authority that we'll work with community groups or individuals that are interested in putting interpretive signs within the parks um, but the park authority will have the, the final approval um, for the language and design on all interpretive signage that goes within our parks. 
Next slide, please. And then finally, um, the last element of the policy is related to commercial signs. Um, we have several mechanisms in place that allow individuals to put commercial signs within parks. Um, you don't see commercial signs throughout our system uh, very often because we're selective on the locations where we're allowing commercial signs. Um, one example of where we're, we have commercial signs are on ball fields um, where our adoption groups are allowed to put banners on the outfield or any of the fences within the park. Um, on the fields um, to um, show the contributions of the sponsors that have worked with that adoption group. Um, other examples are um, other groups that we have long time leases or agreements with. Next slide, please. Um, so there are some nuances um, to this policy that we've uh, requested Cynthia Bailey um, consult the board on. Um, and so, unless there are any questions for Judy and I about the content that we've presented so far on the policy, um, we are going to suggest that we move into closed session for further discussion with the county attorney. This is Mike Thompson. I move the Fairfax County Park Authority Board going to closed session for the following pursuant to Virginia Code Section 2.2-3711A8 for consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal matters that requires the provision of legal advice by such counsel on the proposed Park Authority board sign policy. Mr. Quincy, is that, are you seconding the motion? Muted, sorry. Ken Quincy, I second the motion. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Uh, Any opposed say okay. nay. We shall now go into closed session for approximately 15 minutes. Hey. And we're back in open session. All right, we are now out of closed session. Mike. Um, this is Mike Thompson. I move the Park Authority Board certified that to the best of each person, per, of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under 2.2-3712 and only such public business matters as are identified in the motion by which the closed meeting was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting by the board. Is there a second? King Quincy, I second the motion. All of the favor say aye. Aye. Can any opposed say nay? We we are certified. All right, real quick, really, 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 really quick, because we don't have much time here. Um, thanks again for, for everybody. I just wanted to make sure um, that we acknowledge uh, the passing of uh, Dorothy Norpel, uh, who had a lot to do with uh, Green Springs Historic House. Um, she was almost 99 years old. She served on the board for eight years and uh, played a very, very important role um, in the Park Authority's friends groups. Certainly, uh, she was very, very dearly devoted to um, the Mason District and she will be sorely missed. So outside of that, uh, I mean, you know, er everything's cast in jello right now. Lots of things going on. I had lots of conversations today with um, with uh, the county executive uh, about a number of different things. And, and I also offered, after talking to Kirk, I also offered, I know schools are really scrambling to, uh, to come up with a solution. Um, they're going all virtual now, they say, um, but there are gonna be some special needs kids and other kids that are going to need space to be touched in some way, shape, or form. So I certainly offered parks to be able to help provide some of those spaces if they were required. Uh, parks, uh, schools has not reached out to us yet at this point. So um, that's all I'll say for tonight. Have a great, great August off. And uh, Kirk, I'll turn it over to you. 
You're on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Five months and I'm still not an expert on this. Uh, thank you. Over the last several weeks, dozens of Park Authority staff spent hours making masks to ensure that we were prepared to reopen our Park Authority facilities. In the end, the team made 10,400 masks. Wow. As were donated to other county agencies and to the communities in need. The mask will help ensure the Park Authority staff and volunteers have the great uh, have the gear, excuse me, needed to provide a safe environment at our, at our facilities for staff. Park staff want to acknowledge the county and the park board for their tremendous support and leadership through these unprecedented times. Staff are thankful and appreciate the county and the park board's continued commitment to the welfare of our workforce. As a token of our appreciation, each board member will receive a mask with a Park Authority logo. And I think we have a copy of that that we're pointing yeah. <laughs> all right so we just want to say thank you um your love and your support is felt by all thank you very much good deal okay mr quincy i only have one comment and it's a positive one i've been getting uh, lots of positive response about the reopening of the rec centers and i visited uh oakmar on its opening day it was a little slow but i'll tell you they've got it under control out there and if the other rec centers are the same way, I think it'll be a success. Good deal. All right, Michael. Yeah, real quick. Um, one thing occurred to me while during this meeting, we ought to consider with what schools are going through all virtual. I think that's going to create some unique demands and opportunities for us in terms of use of the fields and parks during the day. There will be lots of parents that, that won't necessarily sit in their house all day, every day. Um, we ought to think about what impact that has, maybe coordinate with NCS um, on the fields, the nature centers, but also things like marketing the nature centers and the golf courses. So just something to consider as we're looking at at this new school normal. Okay, great. Tim? Uh, I pass. Thank you. Okay. Maggie? Yes, thank you. Have enough. Oh, everyone have a great August. Thank, thank you. you. Cynthia? Yes, uh, Bill and I met today uh, with Rodney Super Supervisor Rodney Lusk. We are beginning the conversation about changing the rec center name, which is currently uh, Lee Rec Center, and uh, there will likely be uh, an initial um, uh, meeting uh, in this in the fall, and uh, more details will be forthcoming because a lot of people have been asking about that. So we're in the process. Thank you. There's a, there's a whole coordination with the county, uh, Dahlia, Palchek, and and uh, and uh, Walter are heading that up. And I talked to Brian about that, Brian Hill about that today. So we're trying, we're making sure that we're we're in sync and coordinating with the county. Uh, we don't want to get out ahead of them, so that we have a coordinated effort and make sure that we're doing the right things in the right places. So. That's that's what that was all about. Five. I'll pass, sir. Okay, Jim. Pass. Kyle. Linwood. Happy August. Pass. All right, Ron. Um, I want to say goodbye to Dave one more time. Um, and I also want to let uh, uh, Dorothy Narpel's family is putting together a memorial service, hopefully at Green Spring Gardens. I do not have it date or time, but I'll let folks know. Okay, great. Thank you all for everything that you do, and uh, especially during these crazy, crazy times. Um, your, your, your expertise and your volunteerism is exceptional during this, because lots of people are looking for answers, and you're out there in the community, and you're folks that can, can be the gateway to getting them there. So, Kudos to all of you. Be safe, wear a mask, and with that, we're adjourned. Bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Happy August. Happy August.